Well, I'm really excited to be here. This is actually my first time uh, speaking with uh, RZIM in, uh, in England. Um, I, I was actually, uh, well, let me ask you a question. How many of you are from Scotland? Anyone from Scotland? You, I saw the hands. And back there, one crazy guy, a redhead, perfect. Um, <laughs> wonderful. There was a time when I lived in Glasgow. I was a wee bit to the west of Glasgow. I had a Glaswegian accent. It's true. But then I moved back to the States and it just went out the window. Um, my dad actually lived in Scotland because uh, my dad was part of the US Navy. And uh, during the Cold War, uh, the US Navy had sent people here uh, to the UK. And so I grew up uh, as a Pakistani kid with a Scottish accent. I was beat up a lot uh, when I went back to the US. Um, and that was fine, we survived. Um, but my parents, like I said, you know, my dad was in the military in the U.S., but he came from Pakistan. And so I was born and raised in a Pakistani family. Even though I was born in the U.S., my family was from Pakistan. And they taught me how to live Islam. Now, I know a lot of you might have been hearing things in the news, and you might be seeing things, uh, you know, ever since uh, the past few years in ISIS. And for those of you who were around for 9-11, Islam has been in the media, and we might have some ideas about what Muslims are like. But I'll tell you, my family, as a Muslim family, was very, very peaceful and loving. Uh, my mom taught me that Islam was a religion of peace. How many of you have heard those words in the, in the media, Islam is a religion of peace? Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was taught. Um, I was taught that to be a good Muslim means to worship Allah. It means to, to constantly be devoted to God. So let me give you an example. By the age of five, my mom had taught me how to recite the Arabic of the Quran. I had recited the entire Quran in Arabic by the age of five. Uh, I'd memorized the last seven chapters of the Quran by the age of five because Muslims pray five daily prayers. And so uh, in order to pray those prayers, you actually have to have portions of the Quran memorized. That's what it meant to be a devout Muslim. I'd stand next to my father every day, five times a day, he would recite portions of the Quran in the daily prayers. By the time I was uh, going into secondary school, this is what my life looked like. Before I would wake up uh, and leave the bed in the morning, my mom had taught me to recite a prayer. Alhamdulillahilladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa alayhin noshur. Anyone know what that means? Anyone interpret tongues? No? Um, I didn't know what it meant either, so don't worry. Uh, I recited it every day, no clue what it meant. Um, my mom told me later, what it means is all praise belongs to the one who gave me life, causes me to die, and will raise me up again. So every morning as a Muslim, I'd thank Allah for giving me life. And when I slept, you know, I didn't know if I was going to wake up from that sleep. Thank you, Allah, for waking me up from sleep in the morning. And also the prayer is a foreshadow of the resurrection. Muslims believe that there will be a day of judgment and resurrection where people will be judged based on what they've done, good or bad. And so every morning, waking up, that would be the first thing I'd do. Then I'd leave my bedroom, I'd go to uh, the washroom to wash up. And uh, Muslims have five daily prayers, like I said, but they also have a ceremonial washing uh, before the five daily prayers, each one. But as I'd walk into the washroom, I'd remember to walk in with my left foot first. And the reason why is because Muslims try to copy Muhammad in everything they do. To Muslims, Muhammad is the most perfect man who ever lived. And so in order to live a perfect life, what do you do? You copy the most perfect man as much as you can. And so we would learn things called sunnah. We would learn how the prophet lived his life. And even walking into the washroom, we'd remember, ah, Muhammad would walk in with his left foot first, so must I. That was the degree to which we'd remember Islamic tradition. And then as we're washing up, we'd do the wadu and we'd, we'd pray prayers in Arabic. Then we'd go downstairs to pray the first of the five daily prayers called Fajr prayer. Before the prayer, we had a prayer to pray. And then we'd pray the prayer and then we'd have a post-prayer prayer. prayer. <laughs> And then we'd go to the breakfast table, and my mom would say to me, Nabil, what do we say before we eat? And I remember the Arabic prayer. It was Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. My mom would give me my breakfast, and when I was done, she would say, okay, Nabil, now what do we recite? And there'd be another prayer, thanking Allah for giving us sustenance and making us among the Muslims. My mom would usher me out the front door uh, to, to school in the morning, and she would say, Nabil, don't forget to recite that prayer that Moses recited when he was asking Allah for help to speak to the Pharaoh. 
So Muslims have a lot of biblical stories in the Quran. Uh, and one of them is that Moses used to stutter and that he prayed something to Allah to give him the ability to speak and have wisdom. And my mom would remind me every morning to pray that. And my response to her would be, I know a me who tell me every morning to pray it. I got it, I'm good. And I'd get on the bus and I'd go to school. That's what it was like to be a devout Muslim before seven o'clock in the morning. Now you can imagine when I got to my school then, I felt very, very closely identified with Islam. I mean, I, f I saw myself as someone representing Islam to other people around me. In fact, my mother told me to see myself that way. She said, Nabil, you are an ambassador for Islam. People see your face, they know you're a Muslim, so you need to be the best student you can possibly be. You need to be the most respectful person there. You need to always tell the truth. These were the things my mom told me because she knew I was representing Islam to everyone else. And if I looked good, Islam looked good. But at the same time, I knew when I got to school that most people there were Christians. I mean, everyone in the West, when I, I was being raised, I was taught that everyone in the West is more or less Christian, unless you're a Jew, uh, otherwise you're a Christian. Uh, even the atheists and agnostics, we consider them to be Christians, just Christians who didn't believe in God. And so I would, I would take a look at all these people around me and I'd say, well, you're all Christian, but none of you actually seem to represent your faith. I'm, I'm very proud of Islam. Are you proud of your Christian faith? And when I would talk to other students, I realized that very few of them actually cared about their faith. I knew they went to church. Some of them even wore crosses, but none of them ever talked about their faith to me. Here's what I thought. As a Muslim, this is what I thought. I thought that if you as a Christian did not share the gospel with me, then that meant one of two things. It either meant that you didn't believe the gospel yourself or you don't care if I go to hell. See, I thought Christians believe that I need to know about Jesus to be saved, so if they're not sharing it with me, either they don't really believe it or they don't care if I'm gonna go to hell. And really, I thought it was the former. I thought, well, they must not really believe this faith. It's, it's kind of silly anyway. Whenever I'd ask people about uh, various questions, they'd never really have the, the ability to answer. I remember there was one girl um, when I was in uh, 11th grade. Uh, I don't know what they call it here, but it was just right before going to the university, a couple years before going to university. One of the students in the class uh, came up to me. Uh, her name was Betsy. And uh, she was kind of the token Christian in our school. Everyone knew she was a Christian because she was always smiling. Uh, and the rest of that were like, knock it off. What's wrong with you? Um, but, but she was always smiling, so we knew she was a Christian. And so she said to me one day, Nabil, do you know Jesus? Now, you have to understand, when people come into a, mi a minority context, so they were a majority somewhere else and they come here and they're the minority, they learn how to defend their position, they learn how to defend their identity. And so from a very young age, my mom had been giving me books to read that I could use to defend Islam and challenge Christianity. So when Betsy asked me, Nabil, do you know Jesus? I had read books upon books ready to answer this question. And so I said to her, actually, Betsy, I do know Jesus. And she was surprised. So I proceeded for her and I said, Betsy, I know because the Quran tells me that Jesus is the most miraculous man who ever lived. The Quran tells me that Jesus is in fact virgin born and that he was able to heal the lepers, cleanse the, uh, cleanse the lepers, heal the blind and even raise the dead. The Quran tells me that Jesus is the Messiah and I believe he's gonna come back at the end of times to initiate latter days. And she was shocked, she had no idea Muslims believed that. So she didn't know what to say next and so I, I told her. <laughs> I was like, well, what you believe though is that Jesus is God, I know Jesus is not God. And she said, Nabil, that's the most important part, Jesus is God. And I said, do you really believe that? And she said, yes. And I said, okay, fine. For the sake of this conversation, Betsy, let's assume that the Gospels are reliable. You see, I think they've been changed. I don't think they're reliable, Betsy, but for the sake of this conversation, let's just say that the words of Jesus are still preserved in the Gospels. Where does Jesus claim to be God? And she thought about it for a moment. I could tell she hadn't thought about this before. And she said, well, doesn't Jesus say, the Father and I are one? 
And I said, yeah, but just because you say you're one with someone, it doesn't mean you're the same being. If I say I'm one with someone, it means I'm unified in spirit with them. You know, if you want to see what Jesus said about himself, why not go to the Gospel of Mark where Jesus says he could do no miracles in Galilee? How can God not do miracles? Or what about the Gospel of Luke where it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature? Are you telling me God grows? Or what about back in the Gospel of Mark where, where Jesus says he does not know when the end of times is? Nobody knows when the end of times is, not the angels nor the Son, but only the Father. How does Jesus not know something that he's saying God knows? I thought he was God. And see, the thing was, she hadn't looked into any of this before, and so with each quotation I was giving, and they were all out of context, but with each quotation I was giving, I was shaking her Christian faith, and I ended with what I considered my coup de grace. I said, Betsy, look, if you really want to quote from the Gospel of John, why not go to the verse where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I? I would believe Jesus if I were you. God is greater than he is. Now, if you want to know the truth about Jesus, you ask me, and I'll share Islam with you. And so the one girl in our school who was willing to share the gospel with me, you know, as, as soon as she shared the gospel with me, my respect for her went up because here was someone who cared about her faith. But at the same time, she wasn't equipped with the most basic answers to these questions. And these weren't trick questions, right? This isn't an issue about peripheral doctrine. Is Jesus God? That's an important question. I wasn't trying to mess with her. I was just asking for an answer. If I wanted to mess with her, I'd ask her about the Trinity. Because Christians had no idea what, what to say when I asked about the Trinity. I would ask questions like, oh, you're a Christian, really? Do you believe in the Trinity? Oh, you do? What is it? Oh, God is three in one, okay. So what, is he like a shampoo bottle? What does it mean for God to be three in one? Can you explain that to me? And invariably, whenever I asked someone, they would say that the Trinity is a divine mystery and we should just believe it by faith. And I would say, okay, time out. The way you're using the word faith is the way I use the word ignorance. I don't want any part of that kind of faith. And so because people were not trained with answers, I was able to easily share Islam with them. And by the way, I just received a, uh, a few stress emails from, distress emails from South Africa. Uh, I got emails from friends that work there who are saying that pastors in South Africa are converting to Islam. I got emails from Christians saying, help us, our pastors are converting to Islam, and the reason why is because we're not training them with answers to these simple questions. So this is how it continued on for me. I would challenge people in their Christian faith, and because people didn't know their answers, I felt more and more convinced that Islam was true. All this changed, though, when I got to my university. Um, there was, uh, I joined the public speaking and debate team at my university, and there was another student who was there um, who uh, we ended up spending the room together, uh, uh, spending the night together in a hotel room um, because we were going to a tournament together, a university tournament, and we had to pair off. And so he and I happened to be in the room together. And at night, I see him pull out his Bible and start reading. I was like, oh, this guy's a Christian. This will be fun. <laughs> I was like, David. Do you realize that book you're reading is not reliable? And David slowly closes the Bible and says, go on. <laughs> yeah, you guys caught it. I completely missed it. Um, so David says, go on. And I said, didn't Jesus speak Aramaic? And wasn't the early church in Jerusalem? So they probably spoke Hebrew. But by the time the New Testament was written, it was written in Greek. And so you have a translation of a translation of Jesus' words before anything's even written. And then the New Testament in Greek becomes the New Testament in Latin, and it lasts for a thousand years in Latin before it comes to German, and from German it goes to English. So you got a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. How do I know that you're actually reading Jesus' words? Now, I had used that argument about, against Christians tons of times before, uh, but what I didn't know about David is that five years prior, he had been an atheist. And he had seen a Christian reading a Bible. That Christian's name was Randy. And David went up to Randy and said, Randy, do you want to know why you're reading the Bible? Because you were born in America, 
Had you been born in Saudi Arabia, you'd be reading a Quran. Had you been born in India, you'd be reading the Vedas. Had you been born in the East, you would have been a Buddhist. The reason why you believe what you believe is because people like you don't think for themselves. You just believe what you're told. The irony there was David was raised in an atheist home, so he was just repeating what he was told to believe, but we can forgive him of that. Over the course of a year, David and Randy developed a friendship, and Randy was able to explain to him how the Bible was reliable. David became a Christian, and four years he said, I'm going to dedicate myself to studying the Bible and defending it. And then I walked into the door. <laughs> In fact, David was saying that morning, Lord, I see a Muslim on the debate team. If you can just open the door for me to share the gospel with him. And I walked right through the door. I was like, boom, hey. <laughs> so David responded to me. He said, Nabil, earlier today, you were speaking on the phone with your mother. Were you speaking in English? And I said, no. And he said, but when I asked you what you talked about, you told me in English. Was that a bad translation? No. Nabil, you are multilingual, and you can take the message that you receive in one language and accurately translate that message into another language. That's exactly what the disciples did. Whatever language Jesus was speaking to them, and he might have been speaking Greek, but whatever language he was speaking to them, the disciples wrote it down in Greek, and in our possession today, we have over 5,500 Greek New Testament manuscripts. Nabil, we know with certainty the message of the New Testament. And I looked at him and I said, David, you're making this up. <laughs> I've spoken to hundreds of Christians. No one's told me this before. He says, you think I'm making this up? I said, yeah, I think you're making this up. He said, well, bring it. I said, it's been brought. Let's roll. <laughs> and so for the rest of the night, we just started arguing and talking back and forth about the resurrection, about Jesus' deity, about the Trinity. We talked about everything. And what I realized at the time was that David actually had good reasons for his faith that he had actually thought it through. And for the first time, I had met a Christian who was able to share answers to the questions I was asking. He didn't have all the answers, but at least he knew that answers were important. And he would go back and look up the ones that he didn't have on him. So it was at that time at the university when I realized that it was really, really important for me to choose my own path at that point. Up until then, I had been taught Islam was true and I had believed it, but now my, my horizons were broadening and I was running into other people with different kinds of beliefs. What I realized at that time also was that beliefs have consequences. At the time, I was uh, studying pre-med, um, and I was about to go into medical school. And what I found out was that what we had been teaching people in the university was that the universe, you know, came into existence via a big, a big bang. The universe came into existence. Now, if there's a big bang without a God behind it, our existence is purposeless. Do you follow me? All we just happen to exist. If the universe just popped into existence, then we are accidents. We are cosmic accidents. The galaxies happen to spin. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, happened to produce a solar system. The solar system happened to produce an Earth. The Earth happened to produce life. The life happened to evolve into you. And you are a cosmic accident. That's what we're teaching one another at the university. Have you ever stopped to consider why suicide rates continue to rise? What do we tell someone when they say, is, is my life meaningful? Is my life valuable? If our whole lives in the universities and in the schools were telling people that they are cosmic accidents, that they're just lumps of carbon, what are we telling people about their value? That they have none. When I went through medical school, I graduated as a physician. At no point ever in my medical school training did anyone say to me that human life has value for this reason. Never. We were just expected to figure it out. Why should I take care of my patients if you've never told me why they're valuable? In fact, if you've systematically taken out any reason for me to consider them to be valuable. If we take God out of the equation, we have horrific consequences. And I don't have time to explain it here, but I think that's exactly what happened in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. The Holocaust, I think, was a result of a godless system where they had to ask themselves the question, what make these people valuable? There's nothing that makes them valuable. Let's make ourselves stronger by taking advantage of them. So beliefs have consequences. 
What do you believe and why? I'm not asking you to tell me what you officially believe, because sometimes when we ask that question, we'll give the official answer. No, let's put that aside. What do you actually believe in your heart of hearts? Maybe you want to believe this Christian stuff. That's great. Hopefully we'll get there, but be honest with yourself right now. Where are you? What do you actually believe? Because that's really important. It has consequences. But what I want to add on top of that is just let's be very, very careful. I've seen this lie that's been told quite frequently. I just told you right now, I don't know if you caught it, so let me decode it. I just told you that atheism has led to the Holocaust. Now, do I think all atheists are bad people? No. No. Just because something has bad consequences doesn't mean the people who believe it are themselves bad. There are good people in all religious traditions, but let's not confuse people with their beliefs. You know, we we generally want to treat all people well. I don't care what your background is, if you're Buddhist, Hindu, if you're Christian, Jew, atheist, agnostic, doesn't matter who you are, let's all just get along. Let's just love each other. I agree with that. I agree with that, but that doesn't mean everyone's right. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? We tend to confuse the two. We tend to say, hey, if I denounce your beliefs, I'm denouncing you. That's not true. I can say your beliefs are dangerous, yet I love you as a person. And I think that's what we're called to do as Christians. Speak the truth, but love the people who believe the lies. Are you with me? So, now we've got a ton of religions in the world. How do we know which one's true? How do we know which one I should follow? Let's take a look at the next slide. This is the world religion uh, affiliation. 31% of people in the world are Christian, or at least self-identify as Christian. 23% self-identify as Muslim. 17% are unaffiliated, agnostic, atheist. 15% are Hindu. 7% are Buddhist. 6% follow folk religions like folk Islam or or folk Chinese religion. Uh, 1% are others, and I know Judaism, it says 0% there, but it rounds down to zero. There are Jews, they do exist, Um, but it does round down to zero. Uh, So this is the breakdown. How do we know what to follow? Do we just pick one? What about the other religions? Let's go to the next slide. These are the major worldviews. Unaffiliated isn't uh, one that we're going to discuss here, although I do think it's a worldview. Now, when I was a Muslim, I had to consider these six worldviews, and I had to think, okay, why would I start investigating Christianity and Islam? Well, I think one really good reason to start with those two is if you pick two people in the world, one of them is going to be either a Christian or a Muslim. Over 50% of people in the world are either Christian or Muslim. So it's a good couple to start with investigating. But there's another reason why. If we go to the next slide. Christianity and Islam are the two major world religions that provide tests for you to see whether or not they're true. When it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism, these are very interesting religions. In fact, if you talk to scholars in Hinduism and Buddhism, a lot of them are very hesitant to say that these are actually religions. Um, Buddhism, for example, Buddhism doesn't actually revolve around a theology. Theology comes from the word theos, which means God. There is no central God figure in Buddhism. But it's not quite atheist either because they do have a spiritualist view, a supernatural view, and they do have an idea of gods, but it's not like our God. So it's really complicated to talk about what Buddhism is. Same thing with Hinduism. Uh, It's it's got a lot of a a national flavor to it. Indians are Hindus. Um, A lot of them are, and and it's really hard to extract Hinduism from India. By the way, I I grew up speaking uh, Urdu in in our home. uh, My parents are from Pakistan. That's what they speak. In Urdu and in Hindi, the name for India is Hindustan. It's land of the Hindus. Uh, and that's actually where you get the, the word uh, Hindu from and India. So it's really tied to this national geography. It's not really a religion you can test. I remember when uh, I was in university, I had a friend named Zach. Zach was a Buddhist. Um, and I was challenging him to become a Muslim. I gave him all my reasons why he should become a Muslim. And, he, and I asked him in response, I said, okay, now that I've given you my, my reasons why you should become Muslim, why should I become a Buddhist? And his response was, well, Nabil, uh, you know, Buddhism doesn't really say you should become Buddhist. It's, it's you know, a way of approaching the world. It's a way of, of, of interacting with it. Uh, I really don't think that Buddhism says you should become Buddhist. And then I said, okay, 
I won't. <laughs> Thanks. There really is nothing to, to latch on to, to test. Judaism, I would say the same thing. Judaism, in fact, actually, does that mean I have three minutes left? Oh. We'll skip Judaism, we'll skip folk religions, we'll go to Christianity. Okay, Christianity actually provides tests for whether or not it's true. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, Vince has quoted it a few times. Here's what it says. If Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain, and we are of all people most to be pitied. What is Paul saying? He's saying, look, the resurrection, whether it actually happened, determines whether this faith is true. I'm gonna put this in context of my story for you. In, uh, when I was a Muslim and I was trying to determine whether or not Christianity was true, I looked into where we could build a case for the Christian religion. You know, there's a lot of Christian beliefs, but is there a case for the Christian religion? And I found it in Romans chapter 10, verse nine. Here's the case. This is what Romans 10, nine says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, there's three things. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Notice, all three of those things are things that would have happened in history. Did Jesus claim to be God or not? That would have happened in the first century. Did he die on the cross or not? That would have happened in the first century. Did he rise from the dead or not? That also would have happened in the first century. This isn't like Hinduism or Buddhism where you have to just assume certain truths about the universe. These are things that actually would have happened or not. They're historical. So we can open up the pages of history to determine whether they've actually happened. But this forms a case. Look at it this way. Uh, when I was uh, working in the psychiatry ward as a medical student, People would come in and they would have delusions of grandeur. And when I was interviewing them, some of them would say to me, I am God. And my response would be, okay, come on in. We've got a room for you. It's padded and locked. <laughs> if someone claims to be God, that's pathological. It's okay to think they're crazy. When Jesus claimed to be God, it made sense that the Jews said, no, you're crazy. But then Jesus said, wait. I will prove it to you. I will show you the sign of Jonah. I will rise from the dead. Now, if someone says to me, I am God, I'm gonna think they're crazy, but if they say, wait and see, a few days from now, I will rise from the dead to prove to you that which I've been saying. Okay, I will watch and see, do you rise from the dead or not? Now, if Jesus actually rose from the dead to prove his claim that he is God, we have excellent reason to believe Christianity is true. I looked into it historically. As a Muslim, I didn't want to believe any of that. In fact, the Quran told me not to believe it. The Quran says, He was not killed, Jesus, nor was he crucified. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran says that if you believe Jesus is God, you are going to hell. I didn't want to believe it, but the evidence was that strong. I had a lot more to say, but apparently I speak much more slowly than I thought. Let's go to the last slide. Christianity is testable. It passes the test. It makes sense of the world, and this is what I want to end with. What is it when we listen to music, when we watch movies, what is it that we see? What is the theme that seems to be pervading our music, our movies, our poetry? What is it? Love. It's love. By the way, if you go to countries where women are all wearing burqas and men have long beards, they're doing the same thing. They're singing about love too. It's, it's true. It doesn't matter where you go throughout history and in time and space, people are singing about love. They're yearning for love. Why? I'll tell you why. It's because we are made in the image of God, and God is love. First John tells us God is love. Well, how can God be love? I really wish I could spend more time on this. Maybe we could do this during the Q&A. But the only reason why God can be love is because he's a triune God. 
God exists as a community of love, three persons in one being, loving each other eternally. It's in his very nature to be love. And then he creates us in that image, that image of love. That's why we yearn for love. Listen, that's why we want to care for people. That's why we want to build wells in places where people don't have water. That's why we want to go build homes for people that are homeless. That's why around the world, our generation is striving to express love to people. We're looking for meaning. And we're being told in the universities that we are cosmic accidents. There's no meaning there. But in the Christian worldview, you are made in the image of a God who is love. And that God was willing to enter into this world and die for people who could do nothing for him. And then he says to us, as I have loved you, so love one another. We are meant to love one another. We're built to love one another. And only in the Christian faith is that the case. It makes the most sense of the world. It makes the most sense of the yearning in our hearts. It makes the most sense of history. It is testable. We have excellent reason to be Christian in the face of all these other worldviews. Thank you so much.